Hi and welcome to Emsworth Baptist Church's online service. We really give you a warm welcome this morning and really glad you're joining us wherever you may be. If you'd like more information about our church because you're not a regular, um, please go to our website and fill out one of the connect cards. That's all you need to do and we will get in touch with you. It would be lovely to have you join us when we're back in person. Fortunately, that isn't necessary here, but it is necessary in increasing parts of our lives at the moment. And it was interesting, we had a couple from our life group over last weekend and had great fun in constructing these masks from old socks. Um, so you can find little glimpses of humour in things that aren't particularly pleasant or comfortable in a wider sense. But the real and deep joy of this morning is that we serve a God who has no separation from us anymore. There's no mask or veil or a social distance or anything since Christ's death. We know that um, when Christ died on the cross, that thick curtain that had been in the temple separating the Holy of Holies, where God dwelt, from where the rest of mankind could be, was split. And that curtain, as wide as it was, was split from the top down. It was entirely initiated by God to give a very visual way of knowing that suddenly there was freedom to be in his presence. And so this morning, that's what we are. We are in God's presence. I've been reading um, 2 Corinthians recently. Let me encourage you to read 2 Corinthians for yourself because there's such a wealth of the gospel and its consequences in there. It talks about who we were and who we can now be because of Christ's death and how we live out that life and know it in reality. But in chapter 3 it says, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while God's radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You see, we learn there that we have freedom in Christ through salvation. And more than that, that we have the Spirit that leads us into that freedom and truth. Do you know, most of the reason for wearing masks at the moment is to stop us sharing breath with each other. But we have a creator God who uses breath, or used breath, first of all, in those very early moments of life where he created us through breathing into the dust of the earth. But then more than that, as Christians, when we have our new life, we become a new creation. He breathes his Holy Spirit into us. And those two acts of breath give us our physical body and our spiritual awakening. And so the spirit living in us allows us to know God for ourselves and to be in constant relationship with him which means that there is no need for appointments, as we have around us all the time at the moment, no need for separation or for fear in God's presence, because he calls us to come and worship, to be with him and to know him now. And that's how we're opening our song worship this morning. Come, now is the time to worship. Now is the time to give our hearts. Now is the time to worship Come Now is the time to give your heart Come Just as you are to worship Come just as you are before your God Come One day every tongue will confess you are God One day every knee will bow Still the greatest treasure remains for those Who gladly choose you now Come, 
In our next songs, we continue to celebrate that transition from old to new, from the old creation to the new creation, from the old covenant to the new covenant. The fact that each one of us as a believer has a glorious day where we recognize that we in ourselves carried baggage and history and guilt and shame in our own right and, and in God's sight. And yet God provided us with a saviour who paid all our debts, who wiped the slate clean and who allows us to live as children of God, redeemed, paid for, adopted and cherished. So that's that glorious day, that glorious moment that we're going to celebrate in our first song now. And then we go on to, uh, to celebrate the fact that our God is the only one who saves. And so Paul again writes that there is no other name under heaven by which mankind can be saved. And we have so much to be thankful for that we have been found and rescued by the one true living redeeming God. Hallelujah. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive All my failures I try To hide It was my turn Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Gloria 
at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open Cause when you call my name
announcements for this week and we have a lot going on in our church this week and you should just have a look on the website to see what our regular activities are in addition to this last tuesday our pastor joel and the leadership team met to discuss the reopening of our church building um, ready for worship services with the current restrictions we are going to continue with our online services for the foreseeable future but are working towards a post lockdown service in our auditorium we're really looking forward to when we can be together again also coming up we have a seminar which is being held by annie cluley all about the effects of covid19 her first seminar will be on Tuesday, the 21st of July at 3.30 p.m. and will cover the topics of how has the lockdown and isolation affected us and what do we do now? Exploring fears and anxiety. The second part of the seminar is on Tuesday, the 28th of July, looking at sheltering in God, finding contentment and prayer. To get more information or to book your place, please phone Annie or our church office. We also had an alpha course that was due to run in July and we've decided that the most appropriate thing is to postpone this until September. So we'll put more details out on that soon. Thank you. Stories of the Bible, Paul. This is Saul. Saul was a Pharisee who hated the followers of Jesus so much that he would hunt them down to be brought to trial in Jerusalem. And he would even seek to murder them. Saul was uttering threats with every breath, and he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He asked him to write a letter to the Jews in Damascus that would allow him to arrest any Christians he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Now Saul went on his way. And as he came near Damascus, a light from heaven flashed around him, and he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul cried out, Who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus. Rise and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. So Saul got up, and he opened his eyes, but he couldn't see anything. So the men who were with Saul led him into the city. After three days, a man named Ananias came to Saul. He put his hands on Saul and immediately Saul could see again. And with that, Saul became a follower of Jesus. He became the very thing he had tried to hunt and he immediately began telling people that Jesus is the Son of God, and he taught them about the mercy of God that he had received. And all who heard him were amazed. He then went by a new name, Paul, as he began preaching not just to the Jewish people, but to everyone. Despite many difficulties like being imprisoned, shipwrecked, and narrowly escaping death multiple times, Paul continued to preach about Jesus. Paul said that he would do everything he could to save people and help them know God. And that's just what he did in order to reach people who would otherwise be unreached. And many came to know Jesus because of what Paul said. Paul taught many in his day through his letters but even more have come to learn more about Jesus through the letters of Paul that can be read even to this day. The world is united by an enemy. A virus that is stealing lives and spreading fear.
For years to come, we will be remembered for how we responded. For staying home and protecting our communities. And also for loving our global neighbours. We will be remembered for praying, for giving, to help them respond. In Afghanistan, Nepal, Mozambique, Sri Lanka, Chad, Albania and across the globe, for feeding the hungry, for counselling the sick, for providing protective equipment on the front lines, for helping to stop the spread, remembered for being united, together, remembered for standing in solidarity. The world is hurting and we can help. BMS World Mission is responding to the coronavirus pandemic. We're helping to coordinate the Global Baptist response and we're doing it now in the name of Jesus. You can be a part of it. You can stand in solidarity with people around the world fighting coronavirus and feeling its effects. You can look back on this time and know that you did everything in your power to help. You can respond today. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we acknowledge and praise you. We acknowledge your might, your power, your glory, your greatness. We acknowledge and proclaim your holiness, your righteousness, your purity. And Lord, we thank you and acknowledge for your great love for each and every one of us and each and every person in this world who is on the world, in the world now, ever has been or ever will be. It's amazing. Thank you so much. And Lord, now we come to you for the work of the Baptist Missionary Society. We thank you that you gave that vision to William Carey to found it in 1792 and for all the work that it has done down through the centuries since. But Lord, we pray especially for their current plan to transform a million lives in your strength by the end of this year and that is through the seven ministries so Lord we ask that you would support and increase and enlarge and protect each of those ministries church planting and supporting training in people being self-reliant education health provision and training and justice through education and advocacy training up local leaders to lead your church in different places and parts of the world and to provide relief where it's needed for disasters diseases and emergencies so we thank you for that work and we pray you'd bless it thank you and lord as we <clears throat> look forward to learning from your word about the end times of this world lord we pray that you would inspire us help us to understand the signs of the times that we're in now as you gave that gift to the men of Issachar so that they could decide what to do so lord please help us now to decide what to do and Lord, we know that you are the source of all healing and provision and protection and grace and mercy and love and goodness and truth and light and life and lord we now name before you in these next several moments those of our loved ones our friends our neighbors who need help from you in some way or other so we name them before you now in our hearts
Lord, we lift up each and every one of these dear ones to you. You know each and every one individually. We pray that you would bring your grace, your love, your healing, your protection, your provision for each and every one according to their need, which you know better than even we do. So, Lord, we thank you that you are a God who, who can do that and who does it continually. We are so grateful. And, Lord, we, we bring to you this COVID-19 pandemic. Lord, we know and declare that you will bring this to an end. But in the meantime, Lord, please would you use it for shaking the nation, shaking the peoples, so that many, many, many new people turn to you because when they seek you with all of their heart, we know we have your promise that they will find you. So, Lord, we thank you for that. And, Lord, when the COVID crisis comes to an end, we pray that you will give us as your church in Britain, in Europe and in the world, and especially for us here at EBC, a new clear vision of the way ahead, as you gave that vision to William Carey all those centuries ago. Please give us a vision and please give us the grace, the wisdom, the strength to put it into practice in your strength, with your help, filled by you, Holy Spirit. Thank you so much. Amen. Another section of the Bible that I think is hugely relevant to us at the moment is the book of Joshua. And in the early chapters, we learn of the children of Israel who've been circling somewhat mindlessly in the desert for decades and decades on the brink of being given the land that's been promised to them by the Lord for their good. In chapter three, we read, after three days, the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. And of course, we know that he did go on to do amazing things among them. And that's our claim today, that when we consecrate ourselves, God continues to do amazing things. But how interesting that God says, if you follow me, you will know which way to go, because you've never been this way before. We have a Lord and Saviour who takes hold of our right hand and leads us and goes with us. We're not alone and we may not know the way, but all the while we're following him, we are going in the right direction. There's so much uncertainty and sadness at the moment, and it's not wrong to feel those human emotions or to express them. We know Jesus wept, he got angry, he expressed a whole range of emotions that are true of us here and now today as well. But we must never feel hopeless because we have a God who leads us. And this next, this next song speaks so beautifully, so beautifully about those things that we can know. Every verse of it, I can find Bible verses to back up. It's entirely of God, but it's full of promises about strength within our sorrow and God with us leading us, guiding us, protecting us and restoring us. So be encouraged and be inspired to know God in the here and now, in whatever faces us, as we feel his strength within our sorrow. strength within the sorrow There is beauty in our tears And you meet us in our mourning With a love that casts out fear You are working in our waiting 
sanctifying us When beyond our understanding You're teaching us to trust Oh, your plans are still to prosper You have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the flood You're faithful forever Perfect in love You are sovereign over us You are wisdom unimagined could understand your ways Reading high above the heavens Reaching down in endless grace You're the lifter of the lowly Compassionate and kind Surround and you uphold me And your promises are my delight Oh, your plans are still to prosper You have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the flood Your faith When my eldest daughter started secondary school, I went to my first parents' evening and I found myself sitting next to someone who thought they recognised me, so they asked me who I was. And I wasn't sure how to answer them, 
And I was surprised by what I then found myself saying because I basically responded, well, it all depends on who you are. And it was one of those moments where you speak and then you find yourself asking, why on earth did I say that? But as I thought about it, I realised that actually we have several identities. So a question like, who are you? is not as simple as it might first sound. And part of the reason for answering the way that I did was because I often meet people who recognise me from events that I've taken part in. In my role as a church leader, I do sometimes get involved in quite high profile stuff, stuff that even gets on the telly sometimes. And I also present a programme on my local BBC radio station. So again, people sometimes recognise me by my voice. Now, if that was where she recognised me from, then I was OK about that. But like I said, this was my first parents' night at a new school. And if she recognised me from a much more mundane setting, this was not the moment to launch into some great description of who I was and what I did. She might have just recognised me as another parent from our offspring's former primary school. And at the time, we had not actually that long moved back into the area, which unusual for someone in my profession is the town that I grew up in. So I sometimes come across people who recognise me from days past, even people that I went to school with. So although it sounded a bit weird, it was kind of true. Who I was depended on who the person asking the question was. And that made me realise that not only is identity a complex thing, but we'll often be defined by the people that we're with or the circumstances in which we find ourselves. We may be a parent or a sibling or a husband or a wife and each of those demands different things of us. We might fulfil a role at work that has a very clear identity attached to it. But we don't really want to take that identity home with us because sometimes being defined by an identity from one context is not helpful in another. An identity can sometimes be on, imposed on us through the labels that other people attach to us or again, the circumstances in which we find ourselves. We can become a patient, a customer, a victim. And each of these will affect how we are perceived and even how we perceive ourselves and ultimately, therefore, how we behave. And there are some situations where it's really helpful to be clear about who we are and what our role is. But it does mean that we can sometimes lose sight of other aspects of our identity and we can be taken over by things rather than being defined by the person that we are. But I want to invite you for a few moments to think about your identity in Christ, the person God has made you and the person you've become through your faith in Jesus. And I want to explore that by looking at the way that one of the New Testament letter writers addressed the people who were intended to receive and to read what was written. And the book that I want to look at is the New Testament letter of First Peter. And I'm just going to read the introduction or chapter one, verses one and two, for those who prefer it more formally. Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Now, I want to suggest to you that even within these few words of introduction, you have four clear descriptions of identity. First of all, there is the identity of the writer, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, OK, you say he's just signing his name and in the tradition of his culture at the beginning rather than the end of the letter. Well, maybe so. But if you stop and think about it, even that is not an identity to be taken for granted. We're not exactly sure when this letter was written, but had it been 20 or so years earlier, he would have most likely signed himself not Peter the Apostle, but Simon the Fisherman. The name Peter 
was given to him by Jesus. And it was given to him when he first made that connection that now defines his identity. Jesus Christ. Jesus was the name of the teacher from Nazareth who had first called him to follow him. Christ was a name that he'd probably learned in his history lessons at school, a, a name to attach to the great Messiah figure that he and his compatriots looked to as the great rescuer and restorer of their nation. And it was the day that he put those two things together and discovered something of Jesus, Jesus the Christ, that Jesus redefined his identity as Peter the Rock. His identity was rooted in the identity of Jesus. And it was on the strength of his affirmation of Jesus as the Christ that he became an apostle, a commissioned advocate of the gospel. So Peter's identity is defined by his calling to make the identity of Jesus known. And then there's the identity of God, reflected in those words, God the Father, whose foreknowledge defined the destiny of the followers of Jesus, God the Spirit, whose sanctifying presence shaped them as the people of God, and God the Son, who they were called to love and obey and in whom their salvation was secure. And so Peter, whose own identity was so rooted in who Jesus was, recognises that the identity of those to whom he writes is also rooted in God. And he reflects the nature of God through the classic Christian formula of the Trinity, creator, redeemer, sustainer. But as I've already said, although the two are deeply intertwined, he also describes the identity of those to whom the letter is written. And it's here that I sense two distinct ways of defining that identity. Just like the rest of us, they were dependent to some degree on where they were and who they were with. So they could be identified by their circumstances. Exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia. Places they found themselves in, but in which they didn't really feel they belonged. People who were scattered and separated from one another. Or their identity could be rooted in the God who had called them. God's elect, chosen by the Father, those who are sanctified by the Spirit in obedience to the Son. So if someone had asked them, as I was asked, who are you? Well, they could have said, well, I'm a scattered exile trying to find a home in the provinces of Asia Minor. Or they could have said, I'm part of God's community, chosen, sanctified and saved. And it seems to me that the underlying question that is reflected in this greeting is, are you going to be defined by the circumstances in which you find yourself? Or are you going to be defined by the God in whom you trust? And I think that's quite a relevant question for us at the moment, because we might recognise that our circumstances are quite similar to those addressed in this letter. We're scattered, unable to gather together, living under lockdown and in social isolation. And OK, we may not be exiles as such. In fact, we may be getting rather fed up with being at home. But that word that's translated exile sort of means not really belonging. In fact, in older versions of the Bible, they tend to translate it as strangers. And it's certainly true that the circumstances many of us find ourselves in right now do feel quite strange and unfamiliar. And I sense that that's actually true even as we come out of lockdown. You know, there are some bits of this new existence that have become so familiar to us now that we actually feel quite strange going back to doing things the way we used to. But it seems to me that one of the recurring questions that is asked of the New Testament church is, are you going to allow your circumstances to define you or your new identity in Christ. We might even say that this is not so much a question as an encouragement to embrace the second of those, because as I said earlier, sometimes our circumstances can overtake us and we lose sight of who we truly are. And I find it interesting to notice how many of these New Testament letters begin with these statements of identity. Very often they go on to describe some difficult circumstances or behaviours that just don't belong in a Christian community. 
And therefore the writer makes this their starting point to simply remind people that's not who you are. Let your behaviour and your attitudes be defined by the God who has made you. Or sometimes there's a need to remind people that the life that they've left behind is supposed to be just that, left behind. And you hear the writer reminding these new Christians, look, you're going back to your old ways. You're slipping back into the values and behaviours that should no longer define you. Or sometimes they're addressed to people who are facing real hardship. Persecution was all too common in the life of the early Christian believers with all the dehumanising attitudes and treatments that underlie that. And the writers of the New Testament regularly remind those who are struggling, don't be defined by your oppressors. You are who God has made you. God sees your life as the treasure that it truly is. And I would argue that at any stage of life, we also can succumb to exactly the same pressures. And sometimes that can be quite a gradual thing, that bit by bit we're taken over by other people's agendas and expectations or circumstances that are not really of our own choosing, or we just forget who we are. So I think it does us no harm from time to time as God's people to remind ourselves that that's exactly what we are, God's people. So I want to invite you to take some time to simply redefine yourself in the light of who God is and who God has called you to be, just like the introduction of this letter invites its readers to do. And maybe we can use, therefore, the framework of this introduction and the Trinitarian formula that emerges from it to define ourselves. So find some space and some stillness and some room to reflect. And as you look at these words again, maybe begin with the writer of this letter, Peter the Apostle. And simply remember that he describes himself this way, because that's who Jesus has called him to be. So who has God called you to be? What are those gifts and ministries that God has invested in you? What is the place that God has called you to fulfil in the body of Christ? You know, circumstances have changed quite a lot in recent days. So perhaps at the moment you've lost something of that and you need to reclaim it. Or maybe this change in circumstances has helped you to rethink what God is calling you to be right now. But I would simply invite you to reflect on that journey from Simon the fisherman to Peter the apostle and ask yourself, what is the equivalent of that for me? And where am I? on that journey. And then think about that description of God the Father, God who has been there from the very beginning. Now I know that over the years people have got very hung up on what the New Testament means when it speaks of God's elect, but I would invite you to simply take it at its face value here. God's foreknowledge, God's perspective on time and space. Our place and our identity belongs in a time frame that is so much bigger than our immediate circumstances. And God has chosen as his people those who choose to follow Jesus. So just remind yourself that whatever immediate circumstances you are in, you are and you have been and you always will be included in God's people. And we are a sanctified people, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We are called to be defined by God's presence in our lives and we are called to reflect that presence. So what does that mean for you to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit? And God can shape us through every circumstance of life. So no matter how difficult, no matter how unusual or for that matter how welcome current circumstances are. God's work of moulding us and making us or sanctifying us, as the writer puts it here, never goes on hold. So make part of your prayer and your reflection that simple prayer of openness. Holy Spirit, do your work within me. Make me more into the likeness of Christ. And we're also defined by who Jesus is. 
God the Son, whose work of salvation defines our faith and therefore defines who we are as a people of faith. And we may be feeling quite fragile and quite overwhelmed, but our identity in Christ is secure. And this leads us to a call to obedience. And let's remember that Jesus is the epitome of God's love. So this call to obedience is not the imposition of an oppressive God, but the invitation of a loving God. What does it mean for you to live a life of obedience to Christ in the here and now? So who are we? Well, yes, you may feel scattered and strange. Uncertainties and concerns may surround, but we are and we always have been called by God's timeless foreknowledge, sanctified by the presence of the Spirit, held fast through the salvation of the Son and called into a life of loving obedience as a follower of this Jesus. So may God help us all to be the people that we are called to be. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. We hope you have been blessed by this service. Let us pray. Father, whatever is behind us, whatever is going on, and whatever is to come, we thank you. Whether it be good or bad, we trust you with our lives. We thank you that you never let go, and although we may not understand what is going on or why things are happening, one thing is certain, you love us. So whatever storms we are going through, please let us have peace as you rebuke the wind and waves in our hearts. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.